Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, the baby budget upgrade, a new $200 netbook, 28 nanometer GPUs, and making more money. It's a good week for AMD. Intel's going the full matrix, breaking Shannon's law with Dido, mobile internet mayhem, and what is that seventh Santa port for? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 130, recorded July 28th, 2011. Intel goes the full matrix. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by the man, the myth, the benchmarking legend, who is, thankfully, once again at home and not traveling internationally. Ryan Shrout, how are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing fairly well. Uh, I'm, I'm not traveling this week. Next week I will be in Dallas when we record this, uh, getting ready for the PC Perspective Hardware Workshop down there at QuakeCon. So uh, one more week here in the studio as we try to figure out all the new video systems and camera systems and all that kind of stuff with the new Twit uh, brick house and all that kind of deal. And don't forget... Uh, the 17th, I guess. Is that right? I will be up there in Petaluma, so hopefully you'll be able to join me so we can do Twitch from there. Excellent. It's all about Pete's Henny Penny after recording, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for it. It's the fries. They have their own herd of cows, which uh, actually That's brings kind me of to impressive. something. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, go figure. They, they grow their own meat. Um, you have a homegrown problem for the second most awkward segue of the night. We haven't had the most awkward one yet. Your dilemma, 17-inch MacBook Pro with FireWire Express Card and SMB performance, and FireWire is dead to the rest of the universe. Is that your problem? Uh, apparently, you were, yes. You were tweeting That's the about case. FireWire earlier. Right. So my dilemma was for this production video system that we typically use. We have two DV cams, HV30s, Canon HV30s, that stream out through FireWire. Uh, we connect them to an older 15-inch MacBook Pro, one FireWire directly in the machine, one through an Express card. Well, all of the new 15-inch and 13-inch systems have a FireWire connection but no Express card, so I'd only be able to do one, one, um, one camera input, actually. Uh, the only one that will allow me to do that would be 17-inch, which is a 24... $199 laptop, which I don't want to, to purchase. But uh, long story short is we were running some flash media encoder and some new software on this MacBook Pro, and the processing power of this Core 2 Duo system is no longer able to keep up. And especially when we start introducing stuff like 720p video output from here to a stream, like we're going to attempt to do uh, at the Twit Studios and with our own productions, not really an option there. So my hunt for a Mac, or I'm sorry, my hunt actually for a Sandy Bridge powered laptop with one or more FireWire connections and an Express Card slot has begun. And I also believe it ended in about the same two hour period. So it's funny, you need the Express Card slot for something else, so you cannot use an Express Card and FireWire adapter then. Right. Right. Well, I need the Express Card slot to create a second FireWire port, actually, because you can't usually, if, even if a laptop has two FireWire ports, they're shared on the same bus, right? They're just right. two different connections. And if you have two cameras on that same bus, most of the software will not be happy with you. Most of the, like, the switching software and that kind of deal. Oh, funny. So you can't even, because as I say, like StarTech and a couple other companies make two port FireWire Express Card adapters. So those aren't going to be able to handle the. Right. I thought the FireWire networking was so smart it could handle even switching across like inside of a device. So you're telling well, me now. Uh, everybody else in the world, like, uh, I posted these types of questions like Google Plus and Twitter, and they were like, eh, FireWire died in 2004. Nobody's really doing anything else on that. It's time to move on. So, you can buy and a desktop. Buy, where you use a desktop or find a laptop that has USB 3.0 and use some of these Blackmagic adapters and stuff. So that's 
off topic, I guess, kind of little dilemma here. Uh, so this is where I ask the audience for help. If you know of a machine that has meets all those requirements, Sandy Bridge, Firewire, Express Card, uh, maybe even USB 3, that would even increase the uh, benefits that much, then uh, send that along, twitch at twit.tv. Let me know uh, what machine I'm passing over besides the $2,500 MacBook Pro 17-inch model. Does it have to be, so does it have to be a Mac? It, it can be a PC? Nope. It can be a PC, absolutely. Okay. And in fact, I probably prefer that because it's probably going to be $2,500. <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. In more cheerful news, Matrox, somebody we don't usually think about for 3D hardware, <laughs> at least not since the mid-90s. Um, I'm not even going to go into my last round of benchmarking a Matrox add-in card. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Uh, MLAA, quote, Matrox had the right idea, says PC per wrong everything else. Scott Michelle wrote up on the website. Yeah, so this is actually more of a like a, a, a an overview of what Intel has actually done in right. terms of anti-aliasing improvements. Um, and and the, the nod to Matrox here is that they were the first ones to dive into the idea of doing things other than super sampling, which super sampling just basically means that you render the image at 2, 4, or 8, or 16x the resolution and shrink it down, mm -hmm. which as you could imagine, uh, is very difficult <laughs> for a graphics card to do efficiently. You're basically quadrupling mm -hmm. the work to get 4x right. super sampling enabled not very efficient so that matrix was the first one to look at uh, um, multi sampling which is you know looking at individual pixels uh, looking for certain shapes and edges and and and, and doing aliasing anti-aliasing in a more efficient manner um, so what I think last week we talked about FXAA right there was a story at hard OCP right. where they looked at FXAA and, and we talked about the difference between it and AMD's version of MLAA, which is morphological anti-aliasing. And we talked about the pros and cons to each of that there. Well, it turns out Intel has been doing some work on the same thing as well with their uh, Sandy Bridge graphics and even their Clarkdale graphics, the previous generation. Their version of morphological anti-aliasing is interesting in that it does the same type of thing. It, it's actually a post-processing effect on the final rendered image. So. Mm -hmm. The, the GPU renders everything out, and you get the uh, your, a completed frame, but then it passes it on through one more step. And what's interesting here is it actually is passing it on to the processor cores, not the GPU cores. So as soon as it passes off that frame, the GPU begins working on the next frame in the game, right? And then by right. that time, the CPU has to be done with what it's doing and pass on the final, um, final resulting much Im Im improved appearance uh, screenshot. So a couple of considerations there. One, Scott in his, little, in his news post here mentioned that, hey, there's the potential for latency additions here. Right. We were talking about 60 with, frames a second. On just, yeah, yeah, especially if you're trying to move over the bus to discrete graphics, because at that point, it's, it's kind of trippy, because this is, you know, rendering, then passing the, rend the finished render to the CPU to do the, to, the, to the MLAA. And if you're passing it to the CPU, I mean, it's, just, that's, it's, it's milliseconds, but it's a lot of milliseconds in between the GPU and the CPU. Right, exactly. And you, you think about it, um, a, a lot of gamers will complain about delays of 16, 20 milliseconds, right? These right. are some of the lag delays in the worst LCD monitor um, issues right and, and now the same thing can be introduced in this potentially we're not really sure yet they didn't really dive into that aspect of it uh, the mm -hmm. aspect that they did discuss is the performance improvements and if you look at the uh, graph in the news post that looks at gaming it doesn't they don't even say what right. game they're using that's probably just some rendering they're doing at 1280 by 800 a pretty moderate resolution for gamers but if you're gaming on Intel integrated graphics maybe not so uh, far off the mark you look at performance as the scene gets more complex, and obviously it decreases, your frame rate will decrease, or in this graph, the mm -hmm. milliseconds per frame increases, same thing. Uh, and, but if you look at MSAA 4X, which is traditional anti-aliasing being performed on the GPU, you'll notice that it decreases quickly, more quickly. Right, degrees. Right, and then if, right exactly, the performance degrades more quickly. And then if you look at MLAA with pipelining on, pipelining being passing between the CPU and GPU, you'll see that it stays very much in line with uh, the performance of no AA. So how does it look? I mean, is it as good or better than traditional 4X anti-aliasing? 
So this is still just in like the Intel white paper form, so we don't actually have like a version of this driver actually working. Ah. But they do compare that they they mention in their own white paper. So you got to take it for you know the, the grain of salt that you usually would. That their MLA MLAA implementation looks better than the 4x MSA implementations that they currently have. Which also I should point out that traditionally. NVIDIA and AMD's MSAA implementations are better than what Intel has, both in quality and performance. But any improvements for Intel integrated graphics are obviously welcome improvements. So, Interesting. Now, what's yep. going on AMD Steady Video Technology or AMD A-Series APUs? So this, this was uh, actually a feature that was released with the Lano APU, and it was first released mm -hmm. last month, I guess, uh, the A8 series of APUs. They also did introduce a technology called Steady Video, which is really just another way for uh, GP GPU processing technology to benefit mm -hmm. the end user. So in this case, they are using the GPU portion of an APU to kind of fix the wobbly <laughs> video uh, of the, you know, it's shaky cam syndrome, things that you might be used to if, you, if you're if you recording something with a cell phone, or even if you're recording something with a camcorder, you know, you're Basically recording your kids playing the soccer. shaky cam. Right, exactly. So what they do is it's really kind of cool, the technology that they use is, uh, it's it's what people have done to correct it in the, in the past is, you know, they, they, they're do combinations of cropping the image, recognizing where pixels are, rotating the image, you know, and try to keep things in balance. But what's cool about this is that they're doing it in real time. So Ooh. you play back a video on YouTube, you play back a video on Windows Media Player, those types of things, and, and the technology automatically works and stabilizes your video. And there's sliders where you can adjust how much you are, you're allow the video to crop. There's sliders on how strong you want it to try to stabilize things but even the default settings uh, work pretty well we did a little video on it uh, so if people want to go see examples of this working we basically took you know an iphone and you know my htc evo 4g walked around the building a little bit took some took some videos and and, and ran them through uh before and afters and did side by sides with some video stuff so it's it's pretty cool it's one of those things that they're they're obviously not a hundred percent behind yet because mm -hmm. they they don't enable it by default Right, but it's in there if you want to flip the switch and give it a shot. Uh, it's it it does, it 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 actually does what it says it's going to do, and so you know, it, a neat little feature, something they can offer. So it, it does it on a live video stream. Will it also do? Can I take an existing video, something I shot earlier in the year, and have it remove the shaky cam, or only process it on the fly during a so, live environment? Yeah, it only processes it on the fly, so it's not like you can remove the, the shake and then save that resulting video. That's not what this mm -hmm. application or plugin really does. It, so if you, it, it keeps the base content the same, so if you play it back, it will you know, look better for you. But if you play it back on your friend's PC that doesn't have uh, steady video capability, then it will you know, look like the original. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's been interesting. Uh, we talked a lot about on live earlier this year until it, it came out, and, and Ryan decided it was not his favorite gaming experience, technological marvel, right. though it might be. Um, Steve Perlman, the man who invented Microsoft's Web TV and established on live as this will never work startup into a vi or confirmed, basically turned on live from a ridiculous startup to a functioning startup. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, if, I, although I, I don't personally know anyone who's actually using it. Um, uh, I know lots of people who tested it and walked away from it, but basically uh, he's come up with something called Dido, uh, or his incubator, um, distributed input, distributed output, wireless technology, which hmm. claims to break Shannon's law. So Shannon's law is the idea that there's a maximum amount of error-free data that can be transmitted through a sing single communications channel for a given amount of spectrum and noise. So the Web TV or the, the, the Dido crew is saying that distributed input, distributed output, Steve Perlman basically, uh, is a breakthrough approach that allows each wireless user to use the full data rate of shared spectrum simultaneously. Uh, which is like kind of like having every possible person in an elevator at once simultaneously um, by eliminating interference between users sharing the same spectrum. Um, they're basically saying the data rate available remains steady no matter how many users share the same spectrum, which is kind of a really cool concept. It also sounds like a violation of the laws of physics, but again, as I've said before, <laughs> I am not a physicist. Um, right. 
because what's interesting is is they've said they're basically they they put Dido servers co-located with on loads or uh, on live servers, and they said they were getting like a millisecond latency. Um, you know, and and at this point, it sounds a lot like that strange and wonderful fuzzy logic uh, that miracle <laughs> hair growth and weight right. loss products are uh, done in. Basically, though, they're saying instead of transmitting a data packet into a radio signal wave, um, uh, Dido apparently cuts out the intelligence from the radios and replaces them with an incredible amount of computing in the cloud, quotes PC Mag. Uh, you know, it's so beyond my thought. comprehension. Yeah. Well, it's the idea that instead, it's it's kind of just as weird as on live. So on live does the rendering for the game in the cloud and then drops right. it to your PC. Okay. This is okay. claiming it creates a waveform for the radio signal in the cloud. Quote: A so-called Dido data center creates the radio signal and sends it along a wired connection. The access point simply broadcasts the signal. Um, yeah, your 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 face looks exactly like mine. Um, uh, you know, and, hey, and some awesome, people say it's right? just another variation on MIMO. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, you know. um, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I hope they figure it out. I hope they get it to work. We'll all try it. <laughs> and if it fails, then it fails. And then that's actually okay by me because I don't have to try to figure out how it actually works. <laughs> or um, test it. Right. <laughs> One thing we do understand is when companies lose money, uh, which is apparently something that Sprint did this this quarter. Yeah, Sprint. Uh, so we get there's all this craziness going on in the in the wireless space, which impacts me because I constantly use a wireless modem. You constantly use a wireless modem. Um, yep. There's a lot of people uh, are starting to rally in Washington. It's sort of the last minute fight against the AT and T T Mobile merger, um, led by a certain former comedian turned senator Oof. in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I gave away some political affiliations there. Anyway, <laughs> the uh, nonetheless, it, whatever your political affiliation is, I always find it refreshing when somebody's actually questioning whether or not something has any benefit to the American sure. people, um, oh, yeah. more so than the shareholders. But Sprint has lost 877 million and signed a 15-year agreement with Light Square. You might remember them as the people who had the 4G thing that was going to kill GPS, or they claim not kill GPS, and that they were being unfairly branded. Um, but I think it's going to be an interesting two, three years for 4G rollouts and uh, the battle between uh, Verizon and AT&T T-Mobile, which could be Verizon AT&T, which could end up being a duopoly that cooperates politely to make sure our data is capped, depending on how paranoid you are um, right. uh, about large companies doing things that extract the maximum amount of cash out of the American people. You so. know what worries me about this is when I see I have I have Sprint cell phone service I have Sprint mm -hmm. um, 4G service and, and, a, and an air card and all that kind of stuff. When I see that they're losing money, uh, I'm not as comfortable complaining about the prices on stuff anymore. So right. where do we are? Is it is it that prices need to go up or are, are these just badly managed companies? I realize this is kind of way outside the scope of what we're supposed to be talking about here, but it's one of those things that kind of makes me wonder. Is like maybe they're right. But I don't want them to be. <laughs> it's also interesting. I think, you know, it's it's uh, it would be it would be interesting to find more about what's going on in terms of the losses. I was trying to find yeah. uh, something that sort of uh, something that sort of detailed where the exact losses were. Um, I yeah. just thought it was really interesting that 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 they signed a 15-year deal with Light Squared, who. Apparently, part of the, the deal is going to be that LightSquare is going to get access to a fair chunk of Sprint's um, networking or spectrum, okay. which actually might solve uh, a big chunk of LightSquare's problem with delivering 4G that doesn't take out GPS. Or, or according to LightSquare, their lack of a problem, but the problem with GPS devices that don't uh, properly implement standards. In any case, uh, mobile wireless is going to continue to be a hot mess for the next couple of right. years and probably isn't going to get any cheaper. Which brings us to Intel and AMD are actually making yes. money. <laughs> Intel and yes. AMD. 
Right. Um, it's like orders of magnitude difference, but they are both <laughs> making money, which is good. So if we look at Intel, this is just for quarter two. Uh, they, again, mm -hmm. broke revenue and profit records. Uh, very healthy $13 billion in gross revenue and a net profit of about $3 billion. Margins uh, are at 61%, which is pretty good. Down a little bit, but still 61% is awfully good. Um, Last year, they made uh, $2.9 billion. So the profit is up, even though revenue is down, um, which goes to say that they are being more efficient with their materials, their personnel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, a lot of their capability and profit comes from the, they have the best process technology. They, they have the best processor architecture in terms of high performance and mainstream. The only thing that was kind of interesting here is that they do have a weak spot area, and that is in the low, low power, low performance mobile market space. The, it says Adam here has dropped in revenue by about 15% so far this year and is basically Intel's one of their only areas of weakness if we look at their main processor mm -hmm. business cycle. Um, and obviously the main reason for that is the adoption of ARM-based processors for these low-cost uh, tablets and netbooks, uh, Android and iOS, and also uh, AMD's Brazos platform, the, the, the Bobcat-based ultra-low-power um, form factor machines that they have there. So there is a kink in Intel's armor, and ironically, this is kind of where AMD is getting its profit from. If you look at AMD's numbers, they had gross revenue of $1.5 billion and a profit of $61 million. That's That's very, very small. If you look at $3 billion versus $61 million, that tells you a little bit about <laughs> why Intel can basically do anything they want at any point, right? right? Um, that's, that's two orders of magnitude difference in terms of just profit numbers. Um, this is, however, a big difference from this quarter last year. It's a $100 million swing. They lost $40 million last year. They made $61 million this year. That is pretty good. And obviously, that is from uh, their Brazos platform. That is from Lano. The highlights of their call was that they had shipped a million Lano-based APUs. Mm -hmm. And um, they are looking forward to, um, you know, GPUs coming out later this year as well. So they I, they think Q3 and Q4 will see even better margins and improve uh, revenue because they're going to have, you know, NVIDIA caught up in the GPU world. They had, a, AMD had a big advantage in DX11. NVIDIA caught up and now they think they're going to have uh, another edge again there. So, you know, it's good to see AMD making money again. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a it's a good sign for them being around for the long haul as opposed to continuing to bleed forever. Um, Intel's continuing to make money. I guess that's all we need to say about that. If you can, <laughs> if you can make anywhere between two and a half and three billion dollars in profit a quarter, you're probably doing okay. That's almost like Apple money, right? I mean, geez. <laughs> or oil company money. And it's right. interesting. AMD says they're going to have uh, 28 nanometer GPUs out this year, possibly before Nvidia. Uh, um, yeah, that was kind of, this is a flip-flop from what we thought maybe mm -hmm. back in January at CES time frame. NVIDIA looked like they were kind of ahead of the curve in terms of getting to the ne next process step, which would allow them to release the next generation of GPUs, uh, lower power, lower costs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, earlier this year, actually just a couple of months ago, I guess, we heard some rumors regarding NVIDIA and TSMC issues with 28 nanometer process technology they were working on for the mm -hmm. next generation of GPUs. Apparently, that does not affect the work that AMD has done with TSMC. Uh, and to the fact that their CFO, uh, Tom Seifert, did, stay, did say in that same earnings call that um, they had silicon working, working silicon in-house and they remain on track to deliver the first members of what they expect to be another industry-leading GPU family later this year. And the rumors are as early as September, October for that to actually happen. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive, actually. And in the rude and shocking title of the day goes to PCPer.com. Apple is the bomb. Vulnerability found in battery circuitry. Um, as, and, of course, uh, to PCPer's credit, you guys immediately point out that the title is Humor, People. But Charlie Safari, Charlie Miller, discovered a vulnerability in Apple devices. The exploit... Um, uh, basically, in theory, a hacker could gain access to your battery control using one of two static company-wide passwords. Um, That's hilarious. Uh, Safari Charlie, of course, has discovered a whole bunch of uh, 
uh, exploits of the past few years in OS 10 and iOS. Um, but what's interesting, though, is, is I'm going to quote the uh, I'm going to quote the article so I get this right. What does having the ability to write to a laptop's battery firmware mean? Firstly, remember the old advice of get a virus, reinstall your OS. Well, assuming you can actually perform a clean install without ridiculous hacking, the battery controller can simply reinfect you if the attackers knows an exploit for your version of OS 10. Um, so it's it's kind of a it's one of those weird little moments in security and and hardware ownership <laughs> where you realize that maybe just maybe there's a little too much intelligence in every component of your machine. This right. and this this could potentially be particularly foul. Um, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> he, they. The, the idea here is that this is one of the first times batteries have had this intelligence. They have firmware. Even if it's on the battery itself, it's dedicated right. logic on the motherboard and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, you can reinstall the operating system all you want, uh, but if the firmware keeps that issue, then keeps that bug, keeps that uh, right. gaping security hole, which I think is funny that there was like one of two company-wide passwords that have the capability right. to do that. Um, and, and as uh, uh, Scott points out in this news post, right, you know, they're they could do other things like what's the simplest thing they could do they could disable the battery they could make it permanently dead so and it's not right. a user replaceable battery in macbooks so you don't get to just swap out a battery for it uh, they could also even potentially continuously charge it until it explodes we've seen those issues with uh, i think it was lenovo lithium-ion mm -hmm. batteries right that had that bug where they didn't recognize when they were full they kept charging and caught on fire and right. stuff uh, and so I mean, now you can have a hacker do that. You, I, I leave my MacBook Pro plugged in all the time. Mm -hmm. If I had this issue, I <laughs> could have a very big issue with the fire marshal. That would be bad. Yes. More so than I, 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 one of the things I was, I, was, I was curious about is it seems like, you know, it, they, it would have to be, they would have to have pretty sophisticated access to your machine to be able to write to it. So pretty much have rooted your machine or have physical access to it. Uh, if I was reading that correctly, but oh, it's still yeah. kind of a, a frightening thing to consider. Um, <laughs> however, if you own a MacBook, for example, I have one the size of a lunch tray sitting next to me. Um, I'm not going to be <laughs> panicked about it just yet. Yeah. Just saying, don't you don't need to start selling your 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 OS 10 hardware just yet. Um, you know, half of Netflix users are watching on consoles. I thought that was in our notes, um, especially with Voodoo, uh, doesn't do HD on PCs, and the backlash of some of the Hollywood studios. It seems like the everybody's kind of closing in on the home theater PC, uh, unless you're doing sort of over the air boarding or doing a cable mode. It's so like cable card has become super easy for home theater PCs, um, but a lot of the video supplier online are sort of keeping their distance from the ability to run HD video on uh, at least the streaming companies are certainly making it harder to look at HD on right we lost Your Patrick here yeah. and uh, you have to not dead is in purgatory hmm? nope we're good um, yeah, so this is actually a machine we saw at um, CES just this past, or was it C? No, it was Computex actually. Um, this, this was interesting about this is the, the the X101 is an EPC, kind of a continuation of Asus's budget budget uh, netbooks. This is $199, but the interesting right. part is it doesn't run Windows. It runs uh, now. I'm blanking on the name. Ego. Yeah, so it's it's running a non-traditional operating system. It's Asus's kind of mapping and skinning of what Mego is. It's powered by a 1.3 mm -hmm. gigahertz Atom, 8 gig SSD, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, SD card reader. Um, and the battery life is supposed to be pretty impressive on this as well. We're talking eight, nine, ten hours with something like that for 199 bucks is is going to be compelling if people can get past the whole operating system issue. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that for me personally, you know, when I, when I, when I went to an Android tablet, I thought, okay, right. this is a completely new form factor. I am going to be willing to give it a shot here and see what is new about this form factor. And I consider the operating system interface and all that, you know, as part of this new package. But if I get a notebook uh, or a netbook even for this matter, you know, it's standard kind of like 10.1 inch display, Am I going to feel comfortable with this new operating system, um, that type of thing? So, but I mean, well, this is one of the reasons why they can get the cost down so low. 
You, well, it's partially also because they're using what is now, I think, personally, a very uh, <laughs> it's just an it's just the the, the atom even even the uh, the, the yeah. N435 you know it's kind of weird right so it's a 1.33 gigahertz Intel atom N435 or 455 an 8 gig SD uh, solid state drive Bluetooth Wi-Fi supports the SDHC cards you've got decent local storage um, but you know, I'm assuming it's going to be maybe one gigabyte of RAM or two gigabytes of RAM because it's. If Probably you haven't two, checked it out, yeah. you Let can go one. to uh, meego.com and download uh, Mego 1.2 1. for netbooks, which uh, uh, they're working on developing. So if you are curious, what it would be like? For example, I have two netbooks, one of which is in the process of becoming a uh, a uh, free NAS box. Um, if I can get uh, throughput over the USB 2.0 to be fast enough to be useful. And the other one actually, uh, yeah, I know, don't even get me started. Um, <laughs> even streaming MP3s, it reeks of pain. But if you want to see nice. what uh, Mego looks like, go to Mego.com and download the latest version of the, of the software, which I'm going to do right after this podcast. Cool. What I'm also going to be doing tonight is watching Netflix. You are Jealous. well. Then I have a I have a great plan for you, right? Uh, so we want to thank Netflix for sponsoring this episode of this week in computer hardware. Netflix will allow you, as Patrick mentioned earlier, to stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. You don't have to go to the movie store. You don't have to go to Redbox and return something in order to not get charged. None of that is an issue with this. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your PC, Mac iPad, uh, with the new iPad app, of course. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones, too. If you have gaming consoles, Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii, PlayStation 3, you can uh, watch Netflix right on your TV as well. If you're not a gamer, you can still watch Netflix streaming on your TV with an Apple TV or Roku box. Those are inexpensive and pretty easy to use. Uh, but I guess if you're listening to This Week in Computer Hardware, you'll probably be able to understand that and figure that out, too. Um, so instant, instantly watching your TV shows and movies is what it's all about. This is the, the future of media consumption, right? You don't have to worry about what time things are on. You about returning things. You don't have to worry about walking out to your mailbox anymore with this type of stuff. And you can begin watching a movie or show on one device uh, and then finish it on a different one, which is pretty nice, too. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and or TV shows as you want any time. And you can cancel any time if you are not happy with the service, uh, but I do not think that will be the case. Try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up for your free trial, netflix.com slash twit. It helps us out so we can continue talking into webcams and giving you a show on an almost every week basis. So we thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Thank you, Netflix. By the way, thanks to everybody who's watching. We do live on your questions. We want them. We need them. We pine for them in the night. Twitch at twit.tv is the email address. We're going to start the question session of the show with an email from Shane, who is a man I can relate to because he's on a baby budget upgrade. He is not budget <laughs> upgrading like that, his yeah. child. Let me make that clear. <laughs> um, but he wants to upgrade his current rig to be able to run Arma 3 at at least medium bells and whistles. The recommended specs, which, as we always like to say, are usually the worst possible place to start running a machine. Uh, Windows 7 or Vista, a Core i5 or AMD Radeon, Phenom X4 or faster, uh, GeForce GTX 260 or ATI Radeon HD 5770. I would also like to say these are, are these are fairly honest specs, by the way, for recommended specs, because usually recommended specs are to run yeah. something at 640 by 480, at maybe 20, 30 frames a day. Um, but this is actually decently high specs. So Shader Model 3, uh, 896 megabytes of VRAM or faster, 2 gigabytes of RAM, 15 gigabytes of space in your drive, and of course a DVD player to load it. Um, he's currently running an X2 6400 plus, 4 gigs of RAM, a GeForce 9800 GT, a gigabyte uh, GAMA 770 DS3 motherboard, Windows 7 Ultimate, and he has a wife and a 20 month old son, so his budget is tight. <laughs> Australian 300 to 400 dollars. So my question is, what is the most cost-effective upgrade to be able to run Arma 3? Uh, and I would be leaning towards graphics card. Because, um, I mean, the, the... 
Yeah, so first thing I did was figure out how much uh, American currency 400 Australian dollars <laughs> is. Uh, and it's pretty good, 440 U.S. dollars. So that's a nice. I think that's actually a, a, a lot of budget for what you want to do here. Um, so his current system, X2, he does, well, here's, what, here's what's key, is he mentions that the motherboard will accept AM3 chips, which nice. means he can upgrade to, if he's correct, any AMD Phenom 2 processor out there. I just did a quick search for a Phenom X6. You can get a six-core Phenom 2 processor for as low as $159. That comes with a heatsink. I mean, boom, done, right? And then you need to go to... You know, you can get a Radeon HD 6850 for $150 as well. So we're right around $300 U.S., maybe $350, depending on shipping and all that kind of stuff, depending where you're at. And uh, I think it comes well in under your budget and should, I think, should bring everything up to what you need, right? So four gigs of memory, probably fine, right? That's not really going to be an right. issue there. So um, those, those, those were my quick recommendations when he's like, as soon as I figured out how much of my money, his money is, I was, <laughs> was comfortable making those types of recommendations. So, And uh, if they That's have good I mean. online shopping sites in Australia, we highly recommend them, unless you have a good local computer, uh, in which case, please support them so they're still around when you yes. need them at 6 yeah, o'clock on do. Sunday. Because I don't have that. <laughs> no, I don't you. have that, and I would love to have that. Come to California. <laughs> well, I'd rather yeah. pay for the shipping, I think, actually. Um, let's see. We've got an email from James <laughs> about upgrading an SSD on a MacBook Pro. He says he has a 17-inch MacBook Pro, um, 2.66 gigahertz i7 with 8 gigs of RAM. It's going to upgrade to an SSD plus HDD combo. I was wondering if I'll get more speed of a high-performance SATA 3 gigabit per second SSD like the OCZ Vertex 2 or a mid-range SATA 6 gigabit per second SSD like the OCZ Agility 3. Uh, seeing as my Mac only has 3 gigabit per second SATA port and the SATA 6 gigabit per second drive will slow down to those speeds. There's only a $10 difference between the Vertex 2 and the Agility 3. I was thinking of getting the Agility 3 because when I upgrade down the line, I will be able to take advantage of the full drive speeds. Hmm. Um, interesting thought, actually, and I believe James answered his own question. Um, we might also want to mention at this point that some people are seeing uh, something in between mild and horrendous issues with non-Apple SSD upgrades or non-Apple approved SSDs. Um, your mileage on may MacBooks vary a lot. Specifically or? On MacBooks specifically, or, or oh, maybe it's just a couple of friends of mine who've had the issues. So um, you might want to stick, you know, do a quick search in the forums, you know, make sure you have the ability to return the drive if it fails miserably and makes your life a living hell. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I would say, you know, man, 10 bucks faster, just do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, he's right. He's like, if I take this, the, I guess the benefit is if you plan on taking that drive with you to another machine, then you right. have that flexibility. And if it's only $10, that, yeah, that makes sense. That makes good sense. I don't know. OWC is kind of who I've always been looking to at SSD upgrades lately, just because on the Mac side of things, just out of pure fear yeah, that's from, from what some friends have done. <laughs> Andrew's got a question about chipset selection. He says, I'm looking to build a new monster rig in time for the release of Battlefield 3 to replace my aging four-year-old system. One of the things I can't decide on is what motherboard to base it on. I'm looking at an i7-2600K with dual graphics for Crossfire and a dedicated solid-state drive. Choosing a Z68, which are generally more expensive boards, over a P67 board seems redundant to me because I won't be taking advantage of the discrete graphics or the SSD caching features. Is it really worth getting a Z68 board as it is a newer chipset and possibly more future-proof, or will a P67 board serve me just as well for my purposes? Also, one more quick thing, is there much difference between PCI, this is like the question of the month, PCI Express X16 and X8 modes, only the most expensive Z68 boards have two X16 PCI Express slots, many of them throttle them down to X8 when running multiple graphics cards, love the show, keep up the good fight. So, like that. I like that. And keep up the good fight. It is a fight. <laughs> it is a fight. Every week. We want every week with hard to run faster for less That's money, right. and we want it to run. We want it to boot. Uh, you know, I lust after some of the Z68 boards. Um, 
but that just may be because I have the old and busted. <laughs> the the non B three revision. Yeah, the original flavor of Core i seven. Um, right. It's. Uh, Here's my thoughts, right? So the Z68 chipset, what are the main differences that it offers? Uh, the ability to use the integrated graphics on your Sandy Bridge processor at the same time as the discrete graphics and SSD caching features. He pretty much says, he says in the email, I won't be taking advantage of the discrete graphics or the SSD caching. I believe he meant the integrated graphics um, right. on the Sandy Bridge processor or the SSD caching features. So if you are confident in that, then save your money and get the P67 because uh, you still get the overclocking capabilities. You'll still get the multi-GBU capabilities, um, but you know you don't have to pay extra for those features if you don't want them. And they're they're both I stock in 1155. The, yeah, they're both going to be the same in terms of future proofness, right? right? Because the, the, if if they stop making 1150 stock 1155 processors, you're you know Doomed. screwed either way. But I, I think um, if, you're, if you're confident you're not going to use them, then don't bother spending the extra money. I am a fan of SSD caching features and the capability that they might even improve on that or upgrade those types of things down the road, um, which I do not think is something they will offer on P67 options. So, but if, if you know, if you, you obviously know what you're doing, you know you've got Crossfire running, dual graphics, all type of thing. If you know you don't want to use SSD caching, then save your money. And there you have it, Andrew. Steven's yep. got a question about a mysterious SATA connection. He says, I've recently <laughs> purchased an Asus Crosshair <laughs> V990FX motherboard. It has a seventh SATA connection located near the other six SATA 6G connections labeled SATA underscore E1 as media. What is it? And more important, what is the practical application? Is this where I should I connect my, is this where I should connect my case to an eSATA port? What is the SATA port multiplier? I am new to the show, but very much enjoy it and look forward to it weekly and actually he found the app through on his wdtv live hub media player yes sorry i'm like the only person that loves the wdtv no we have players. one here we have one at the office actually um we do use it i don't know what app he used to find us but i'm interested in that now so sata underscore e1 on asus motherboards so the, the key the clue that tipped me off was that he says a as media it, it, it's right. labeled as media which is a company it's basically asus right mm -hmm. it's it's the same it's it's just a branding that they have and it is logic that they bought for storage controller branded and, and put on their thing so here's what it is if i looked up the motherboard specs the asus crosshair uh five which is a 990 fx motherboard has one external sata connection and then this internal SATA connection, they both stem from that same as media chip. So basically that chip supports two SATA ports. They decided to put one on the back panel for eSATA, external SATA communications. And they're like, well, rather than throw the other one away, we'll just put an extra port on the motherboard. So you don't have to use that for eSATA. You can use it to connect any SATA drive, an optical drive, a hard drive, an SSD, anything you want. It's just not, you know, it's not, uh, coming from the um, 990FX chipset directly, it's a third-party chip. It's just like having a Marvel controller right. or something like that on your board. Because it's not on the chipset, will it run slower? Um, there's the potential for that. I don't know if it's a, It's probably not a SATA 6 gigabit per second port, which all of the mm -hmm. other SATA ports from the 990FX chipset are. And you also will, I wouldn't get your boot drive because you have to worry about loading drivers before you install Windows during the whole F6 method thing, you know, but if you've already got Windows running and run out of SATA ports, feel free to use it, right? I mean, that's, right. that's what it's good for. There you have it. And Ray an has finally oh. emailed us. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Uh, he had an update for us on advice that apparently we gave him previously. He says, hi guys, long overdue update. Seven months ago, you answered my question regarding how many watts an AMD Fusion system needed. And he pointed us to a YouTube clip. I, I, don't, I guess I didn't look at it. It might have been us discussing that. <laughs> I have since built a system based on a mini ITX ASUS E35M1i Deluxe fanless motherboard, where I used a case which came with a fanless external power brick. Power supply of only 60 watts. And he says, I uh, linked this to a test that showed that it only used 23 watts on load in that particular board. Just wanted to chime in with my experience. The system runs fine, connected to my TV via HDMI with great picture and sound. I used Boxy as my home theater PC software and couldn't 
be happier. Flash and HD and other HD content plays nice as well. You can see the components in this Norwegian blog post, and it gives us a little link there uh, that kind of gives us an overview of what Mini ITX KC used and the motherboard actually, and then kind of installation methods and that kind of thing. Uh, that kind of thing it was really cost effective, and I was impressed. Right, this is what we want. We want people to take our advice, and hopefully it works out, and uh, they can report back to us. If it doesn't work, you can also email us. I don't know if we'll admit it on the show. Chances are we will, but... I think actually either one of us are pretty good about owning it. At least, I, oh, yeah. I, I think we're pretty good about owning up to our failures. <laughs> Epic or otherwise. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, actually we'd love to hear more of that. Twitch at twit.tv is the email or you can send your Twitter to at Ryan Shroud or at Patrick Norton. Uh, obviously we're not the most creative campers on the Twitter. Uh, but we're pretty easy to find by our names. Are you are you on Google Plus, Patrick Norton? I, I am Patrick Norton on Google Plus. I'm one of several Patrick Nortons on Google Plus. Yes, that that is the I, issue. There's no there's no handy URL we can give out, right? So and uh, there's no pseudonyms and there's no corporate ones. And I just want to say to to a couple of Patrick Nortons in other parts of the United States, I've really enjoyed getting your uh, <laughs> mortgage uh, mortgage uh, information and uh, your school applications. So to the Patrick nice. Norton who wants to go to college, do me a favor and answer the phone call next time I make it, or I'm going to call all your colleges back and say mean things. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a common name, but, you know, I, you, you really should be able to give I, I don't have that issue, address. right? Ryan, Ryan Shrout, no. not a very common last name. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's one other Ryan Shrout that I know of who was a guitar player in a Christian rock band, and I don't often get mistaken for him. So there you go. <laughs> You're just not that kind of hair guy. Sorry. Yeah, just, exactly. Everybody Spike seen... it up. Oh, man. That's even more scary. I'm going to call it. That's it for Twist This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.